Okay, this is a strange uh, set of figures, but what it actually means is uh, horrendously and shockingly, next Tuesday, uh, the 22nd of October, uh, represents the 40th anniversary of me first walking through the doors of 66 Portland Place for my very first job in this industry. It was actually a temp role, uh, and 40 years later and three more jobs further on, I'm still working for this industry. Um, and what I wanted to do was really just share a, a bit of an overview of the context that we find ourselves in here today, because over the 40 years or 40 years minus four days that I've been working in this industry, I found it at its best to be a highly professional industry with enviable professional qualifications and a reputation internationally that is second for none. I came back from Athens where I made a speech at a conference exactly a week ago uh, and everybody I met in, in Greece spoke absolutely highly of our industry and how they wanted to actually emulate some of the things that we've achieved. But obviously at its worst it's been an industry fraught with problems and I mentioned just a few of them on this slide. Road traders, unfair payments, appalling health and safety in the first uh, 10 to 12 years of my working in the industry. But we can make paradigm changes and the huge improvements that have happened in health, safety and welfare on site, a 66% reduction from John Prescott's challenge at the uh, summit he arranged uh, in 2001 uh, to 2010. Every death is one too many, but we reduced the number of deaths by two thirds and since 2010 they've continued to come down and stabilize at a much lower uh, rate. And there are many, many other things that the industry can be proud of. You know, we have a considerate constructor scheme, we have construction area, and we have the construction skills certification scheme. We have an awful lot of things that make this industry a better place. But in the time that I've been working here, there are three things that have occurred to me in the last two years and uh, didn't occur to me very much in the first 38. First of all, in my work for those first 38 years, I very rarely ever sat down at the same table as anyone from the fire safety sector. I had virtually no connection with the fire and rescue services and I had very little connection with the professional and other bodies that represent fire safety. Actually, I will go further that, than that and I would say that when uh, connections to the fire safety experts in the industry were mentioned, often, particularly at a project le level, I found other professions within the industry who saw the involvement of professional fire safety experts as perhaps an inconvenience, perhaps an irritant. They weren't really necessarily welcomed. Secondly, uh, although I mentioned earlier about the enviable reputation of our industry, when I started to look more deeply into the competences of the people working in our industry and at professional level as well as all other levels, particularly when I was chairing the competence working group for Dame Judith Hackett during her review, it became clear to me that actually the fire safety content in most of our professional qualifications was either non-existent or if it was there it was pretty risible. And thirdly, and this is the important thing that ties all this together really, I calculate conservatively that in the 40 years that I've worked in this industry, I've attended around about 15,000 meetings of one kind or another, all with a view to improving the industry in one way or another. And we've talked about all the issues that I've just mentioned, health and safety, etc. But I don't ever remember having a discussion before June 2017 about the safety of the buildings that we were creating for the occupants and the residents that were going to inhabit them. I mean, frankly, we just took those issues for granted. And then, of course, um, this dreadful event happened. I'm not really going to talk at, at all about Grenfell. What we do know is that the report of the public inquiry, the phase one report, is anticipated uh, for the end of this month on the 30th of October. Um, 
nobody should uh, speculate on what that report is going to contain, but we've all heard the evidence, and undoubtedly there are going to be a great deal of criticisms, um, not least of the construction industry and the way in which that building was procured. Um, and it's not just Grenfell, of course, because through the summer we've had pretty much a major fire a month in London, Barking, Notting Hill uh, and Clapton in September. And uh, actually these fires in the main ha have been in multi-occupancy buildings that are unlikely to be covered by the new building safety uh, regime. And that's uh, an interesting thought. Um, and we're not just talking about fire safety. I think it's really important um, to say that this issue, this, the Grenfell disaster, and all the work that's been done ever since the Grenfell disaster has opened up all kinds of other issues of fire safety, not just ACM, uh, but other forms of cladding and combustible materials. The toxicity of furnishings that the British Institute of Interior Design is a member of CIC. They're about to produce a research report about the problems of toxicity from furnishings in, uh, in, in, high, uh, in fires in high-rise buildings. And of course there's structural safety. I don't think anybody could accuse the structural engineering industry of not taking structural safety uh, uh, seriously. That's one important thing that comes out of Dame Judith Hackett's report. But for the grace of God, we might be here today talking about the deaths of school children at Oxgang's primary school if a wall had collapsed at a different time on a different day. And while we were preparing our Raising the Bar report, I got a letter from a coroner uh, following the death of a man from Legionella pneumonia claiming in his report, and I think reasonably, that the construction industry and the engineering uh, profession do not really understand the issues of water safety. So we're talking about issues much wider than fire safety, however important the fire safety issue is. Now, Dame Judith Hackett, anyone who's met her, and unfortunately she isn't able to join us today, but she's being ably substituted by Paul Nash, a member of the Industry Safety Steering Group. Dame Judith doesn't pull any punches. If you were here on the 18th of September at the first of our conference, you will have realised that. And in her report, she didn't pull any punches about competence in the construction industry. She said competence across the system is patchy, there's a lack of any formal process for assuring the skills of those engaged at every stage of the life cycle of what we were then calling higher risk residential buildings. There's a lack of coherence, it's fragmented and surprisingly, given what I said at the very beginning, we're behind other parts of the world. Now I actually think there's a subtext to this because we keep talking about construction but actually I don't think we're talking about construction at all. I think we're talking about the building industry. And I think the fact here is that the building industry lags way behind infrastructure, that other part of construction, in terms of the ongoing safety of the facility that we create. And competence and a safety case are very big parts of that shortfall. Dame Judith asked the industry to get together and come up with solutions and we accepted that challenge. Uh, many, many people, many, many organisations uh, came together and this was uh, the product, Raising the Bar, an interim report, very important to stress, an interim report. It was a few weeks late. Uh, we had planned to publish it at the end of June. We didn't publish it until the middle of August, but I'd like to think that we adopted civil service time. Sorry, Lindsay, but we were probably on course course for a year in civil service time in our uh, publication. Um, it's been a huge effort uh, by the industry. Um, in fact, I would go so far as to say that in those 40 years that I've been working for the industry, it's been the broadest alliance by far that has ever come together for a common purpose, bringing together the whole of the fire safety sector, the whole of the construction sector through its trade and professional bodies, the whole of the built environment sector through, through its professions, and all of those who act to represent the owners and managers of uh, higher risk residential buildings. Together, we've contributed about £7 million of money from the industry in terms of that expertise, and I'm very proud of the fact that at no time have we gone to the government and asked them for any money to support us, because I believe, and I think everybody on the Competence Steering Group believes, that this is the industry's job to sort out. Um, we set up 14 working groups. 
More than 300 people have been directly engaged in that process from more than 150 organisations. And through this consultative process, we've at least doubled that. Uh, if you've managed to read it, we have a 600-page report with all its annexes. But really, that report just focuses on two significant work streams. Firstly, enhancing the competence frameworks, and secondly, establishing a role and remit of an overarching competence body, both tasks that, Sir Ju uh, that Dame Judith gave us. Um, the competence frameworks, I'm not going to go through this. If you've read the report, you'll know what the, what the working groups have been about. But the important thing to say is this isn't the end of it. I mean, Dame Judith started with just six areas. Uh, the competence group, under her review, extended it to 10, and the competence steering group extended it to 12. And in raising the bar, we identify lots of other areas where we think there is a need for competence enhancement similarly. So there is much more work to be done. Um, I'm not going to say very much about this because Scott uh, Steedman is going to speak to you later, but just a quick um, intro, if you like, to the system for overseeing competence. The, the proposals uh, really re rely on the key duty holders and the other people working on higher risk buildings. So it's two tiers of responsibility pulled together by two sets of British standards or PASs. Um, Schemes to meet those competencies, and this is an important thing to say, will still be developed by the organisations that are responsible for competence within their sector, within their occupational areas at the moment. Nobody is going to take over that role. So it will be the professional bodies and the trade bodies and the training bodies that we will look to to produce the schemes that will meet the accredited standards. And it will be third-party accreditation through UCAS or through the Engineering Council, or through some other body that will tie all that together and make sure uh, that we're not marking our own homework. A Strategic Building Safety uh, Competence Committee is going to be established. It may or it may not take over aspects of the competence steering group's role. I think many of us on the steering group think there is still a need for some sort of underpinning group that brings the industry together. Um, and the government will, uh, has suggested already in its consultation that this committee will sit under the new building safety regulator. And to tie it all together, there will be a register of competent duty holders that building owners, managers, and most importantly residents uh, will be able to consult to ensure that the people doing the work are competent to do so. Um, now, as we know, uh, the proposals for reform of the building safety regulatory, uh, regulatory system, which when we met as a conference last on the 18th of September, were just that, proposals. Now we know, as of last Monday, how serious the government is about bringing them forward into legislation, because that bill was there in the Queen's speech. And I know there's an awful lot of conjecture about the Queen's speech and how long it's going to last, because there's going to be an election. But I tell you this, I've spoken to people from every single party and I have no doubt that, uh, that uh, reforming the building safety regime is pretty high up uh, the list of priorities for every political party. So whatever happens after the 31st of October, I am reasonably certain that we will move forward uh, with a change to the building safety regulatory uh, system. And obviously we won't know that until we see the party manifestos, but I'm reasonably confident about it. I'm also confident that the things that the industry has asked for which is to extend beyond fire safety, to extend the buildings in scope, to have flexibility to extend further over time, to uplift the competencies, and for a commitment for oversight and accountability, to have teeth, if you like, uh, is all there in these proposals. And the other thing is that they are dovetailing exactly with our proposals in raising the bar. Um, the government has moved rapidly. Uh, uh, governments are always criticised for anything, but I have to take my hat off to how quickly the government has moved in this regard. The building safety programme was set up almost immediately after Grenfell. Uh, before that, what, what did we have? We had a few people working in a building regulations uh, department, was, which was kind of in a broom cupboard at the bottom of the stairs somewhere. Now there is a fully fledged, important building safety programme, and it is absolutely committed to making buildings safer and to make residents and occupants feel safer in the buildings that they occupy. As I've said, government is acting, that's very clear. But, and this is a key message, and it's something that Dame Judith said to us on the 18th of September, 
Why does industry need to wait for government? Because 95% of the stuff in raising the bar and much of the stuff in the consultation on improving the building safety regulatory regime, the industry can take that forward. And we shouldn't wait for government to be able to do that. Somebody asked the question at our last conference, is the regulatory burden worth it? Well, as far as I'm concerned, that's a question that really should not be asked. Uh, so let's just conclude. I'm getting the two-minute sign from Hannah, which means I'm two minutes early. The key thing is that we need your views. There is a platform. Please take note of it. Ask any of us in the intervals if you want to have it written down. You can go on that platform and you can give us whatever views you want about the proposals that we're making, about the unintended consequences of those proposals, about things that you think we may have missed out. It's very, very important that we receive the views of the people who are working in the industry, who are employing people in these sectors, who are training people in the training bodies. So thank you very much for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of today and we really need your feedback. Thank you.